question for Ireland. Yeah, thank you so much, Russ. <laughs> if you go to Dublin, you can see just about everything you need to, that's unique with one exception from Dublin. So uh, yeah, I would love to, I would love to visit Dublin. I really it's my it. favorite European city. It is like the most friendly, walkable, you can find everything you want and you can go see within an hour or two of a bus ride or train ride. You can see like, that's great. All these fabulous sites that like, oh, wow. I mean, you can also drive it all, but you can like, there's a million things to see in I in Ireland. Your classes seriously make me want to travel so bad, Russ. Yeah, <laughs> you know, that's the Absolutely. worst part of it right now. The more I, I do know. it, the more I'm like, oh, no. I gotta go. <laughs> yeah, most definitely. <laughs> Your classes are great, Russ. Here's yeah, my dream, great. Brandon, is I go spend two weeks in Dublin and I just do classes from Dublin and I can do them like part of the day. So you're, you're six hours ahead or five hours ahead. That would be great. So Hi, I Carol. post and you're good to go. You guys have a great session. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Thank so you. Lisa. Brandon, your co-host. Yes. The, everything's set for you, Russ. Okay. And you can hit the, the record button. Hi, everybody. Yeah, sure. I'll do that. Hello. We've got, hi, Carolyn. Carol, Carolyn. Yep. And John Kalina. And it's actually Nancy. What's that? It's actually Nancy. I'm in the process of renaming me, but John may be joining us. <laughs> oh, that'd be nice. Sorry about that, Nancy. That happens all the time. My wife used to be so frustrated when she'd go into Zoom meetings and they would say Russ and everyone would say, who? <laughs> I don't mind at all. <laughs> Welcome, Vivian. Welcome, Susan. And hi, Gerald. And Salwa, Verna, Lynn. Hi, Lynn. Lynn, Lynn and Linda. We got so many familiars. Hi, Wanda. Wanda's back. Hi. Wanda's been here every day. Hi, Karen. It's Hat Fridays. So Karen's got her hat. <laughs> Elaine. And we've still got one person connecting. Lots of, lots of regulars here. Some new folks, which I'm really glad to see. And we've got Brandon here today, who's our... TA and I'm putting together a personal travel plan for Ireland for Brandon. All the things you can see if you stay in Dublin. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody here been to Dublin? We're not doing Ireland today. We're doing France. But Ireland is just, I hate the question. Like if you could go one place where you could go, I'm like, I can't answer that. But if I really had to answer, I'd say, okay, if you really put me to it and I was allowed, to, I was leaving the country, I'd go to Ireland for two weeks because the Irish people are just so wonderful. Amen. And I, you know, a lot of Americans have some, a lot of Americans have some Irish ancestry. My wife's a Fitzgerald. She says she's got a lot of it. I have a bit, but what you don't realize until you go to Ireland is how many of the Irish have American family. I mean, it might be someone went, you know, 50 years ago, hundred years ago, 150 years ago, but they, 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 they know that they know who that family is that left to go to America and um, hey, Fred, good to see you back again. Yeah, my it's, daughter's it's, married to an O'Connell. There you go. There you go. Uh, then you realize that the Irish all they love they love Americans. And my wife would meet people, and she said, "I felt like I've known them my whole life." I said, "Well, you probably you have, have in some way or another." Okay. So, um. Yeah, my wife's a Fitzgerald. The first time we were I don't know, driving somewhere and we came across a business that said Fitzgerald, we had to get out and let her have her picture taken by it as if it was a novelty. And by the end of two weeks, we were like, we're sick of seeing Fitzgerald everywhere because there's Fitzgerald everything all over Ireland. Welcome, everybody. Glad to see you all here Friday afternoon. I checked the video to make sure it worked today. Yesterday, for some reason, we couldn't get full screen video. I think it was my computer. So today we should be doing much better. Good to have a whole lot of, of, of regulars back, but many new folks. Anybody here today, this is your first Get Set Up class. Nobody so far. Anybody, this is your first Get Set Up day. So I've had some people say, yeah, this isn't my first class, but it's the fourth class I've taken today. And this is, I just took my first class this morning. morning. Well, it's great to have and you I all here. And I have a note from Get Excuse me. Hi, Carolyn. Oh, 
Okay. I I just got a note from Get Set Up today. I think what it said that I have done 51 classes, 3,060 minutes <laughs> last year. How about that? Congratulations. That's that's or did great. you hear me? I'm sorry. That's great. Yeah, when you're on the what what uh, gets up to the homepage, you know, if you're logged in, it knows who you are. It'll tell you how many classes you've done, and it'll tell you um, how many minutes you've done, and all that's a lot of fun. No problem. Margaret's gonna. Yes. gonna, gonna We we'll give it about one more minute for everyone else to join. Well, I had a lot of trouble signing in, so I never did get to the page where I could sign in, but it let me into your class. So that's an interesting thing. So you were at the Get Set Up website? Mm hmm Okay. The best way to join a class, and we I just went over some um, new this over with some uh, with some new folks today is uh, you should get an email when you register for the class. And then usually we send you an email an hour mm -hmm. before the class starts. And that'll, that'll take you a link right into to, to, to well, join. I've been, I've been doing this for months now, but my problem was I couldn't even get in. When I finally did go to getsetup.org and I could pull up the schedule, then I couldn't book future classes but it did let me launch into your class when you started. But so, it never did come up so that I could sign in. I'm, I'm assuming it takes me out of the system daily or something because I, ha I don't sign up in all of the time to you record. Know, let me just say, if you call the help desk, they'll solve your problem, I believe. So uh, who do we have here? Who's the TA? So yes, our TA today is Brandon. We're welcoming Brandon. Okay, because I got disconnected. I just got back on. I wanted to let him know just in case I get disconnected again. So <laughs> yeah, we're, yeah, Werner, can you let me know your issue in chat? I'm sorry? Can you let me know your issue in chat? If, if you have an in issue, okay, Verna, uh, go ahead and put it in the chat okay. and Brandon will see if he can help you out there. We have a great set of uh, tech people and TAs. Brandon's our TA today. I really enjoy having them all. They're a great support to the guide. So uh, this is a good size class. We've got 35 people so far. And this is a really good tour today through Dordogne or Dordogne. And through some of the history of France. How many people here have been to France? A lot of folks. Great. I have two. I've been wow. to Burgundy, Alsace, and Paris, and I intend to go back. Pam, hi. How are you doing? Did you have a question or a comment? <laughs> no, I was just saying I've been to France. <laughs> oh, sure. You were, you were waving your hand. I get it. That makes sense. Very good. I would like for my uh, ashes to be taken to the lavender fields in Provence, <laughs> my favorite place. That that would be a good place. Let's hope that's not too soon. I lived in France. I went to school <laughs> in well. um, university. Where was that, Janice? Mm. I went to the L'Institut de Touraine in Tours, France, about uh, ah. two hours outside of Paris. And then Fabulous. What an experience. I have an ambition to walk across France mm -hmm. in a couple stages. There is parts of the Camino de Santiago that start in uh, some different city, I might say start in the mm. middle ages when people wanted to walk the pilgrimage, they would gather in different points and kind of wait for other pilgrims to come together. And one place was Paris, mm. one place was Vizelay, and another place was Le Puy. And I would like to walk, especially the section, I would like to walk yes. any of them, but I would like to walk, especially starting with 
the section through southern France, Le Puy. So, uh, and that will go through some of the sections that we're going to see today. Glad to have everybody here. Um, if you have any questions uh, or would like to add some thoughts, you can put them into the chat today. And uh, after we're done looking at Rick Steves, we'll have plenty of time for discussion. Looks like we got lots of Francophiles, lots of people here who visited France. And uh, we can talk about this. This is also uh, dear to me because my mother-in-law is an artist and she loves the uh, paintings in the caves that we're going to see today. And she's done some replicas of those herself. And I should have told her she, could, she should come to this class. I think she's got some other things going on this afternoon. So she won't be able to do that. Great to see you all. Let me ask again, anybody here in the class today who's new to Get Set Up? This is your first class or your first day with Get Set Up. You can raise your hand or raise your virtual hand. I see lots and lots of familiar faces. Otherwise, it's great to have all of you here today. I'm going to go ahead and do a, a share of my screen. And you should be seeing something that says History Fridays in France, right? We all see that? If I get a nod from someone, I'll know we're all seeing it great. I'm your guide, Russ Eanes. I'm from Harrisonburg, Virginia. Kind of wishing I was in France today, maybe. I'm a writer, a walker, and a cyclist. I formerly was a book publisher. And when I was a publisher, my favorite thing was to help authors put their ideas in between the covers of a book. Now I'm a full-time guide with Get Set Up, and I love the energy that I get working with learners. So today, uh, classes like today give me a lot of energy. Get Set Up helps you learn useful skills from people like you so you can do wonderful things. We learn from each other, so ideally we can see you and your cameras are on. You can request a recording after class of this class. You email help at getsetup.io. And if anyone is joining by live stream, and by the way, we are live streaming today, the best way to participate is to join us and register for a class. We still have room in today's class. So if you register and join the class, you can ask questions or give comments. And by the way, Get Setup's not paid to promote any specific products. So if you see anything today that looks like a product promotion, it's just an accident. Rick Steves was on Get Set Up on April 13th, and you can watch it again. I'll make sure you have a link in your class follow-up email. Uh, but also, if you go to the website, Get Set Up, you will see that we're replaying Rick Steves. So if you just check the schedule, you should be able to find the Rick Steves replay. And anybody who watched the interview will know it was fabulous. Uh, it was one of those things we just kind of had to end. One of the persons in this class today, at least one, maybe more, was in that class live, Joanne was in the class and uh, she really enjoyed that. Nancy, did you have a comment before we begin? Yes. When I tried to get into the two classes that were replayed by him, I couldn't get in. I guess they were booked. I hardly get in. When's the next class? Interesting. Well, I'll, we'll take note of that. Brandon, will, our TA will take note of that and see I if he can. I in, but they were booked. Okay. He'll take note of that and see if he can help you out for the next time that class is in. However, he we also can point you to a YouTube video. You can find it on YouTube. And then that uh, should satisfy your need to see that. The I love diabetes class gave the, uh, the, video, the uh, link and it wasn't the right link because it didn't open. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll make sure after class you get something, Nancy. So okay, uh, hang in you. there, we'll, we'll get that to you. Okay, thank you, Ralph. You're welcome. Uh, Rick Steves has a great travel philosophy. It's one that I appreciate personally. It's what I talk about is slow travel, which is immersing yourself in a culture. And in fact, I'm doing a class next week on slow travel. If you want to come back Monday at 11 o'clock Eastern Daylight Time, you can join us to talk about slow travel. Uh, but I appreciate Rick because um, last year when the travel industry took a huge hit, and if you think the airlines had a hard time, Anybody that was in the travel industry, like they were guides or they were guidebook authors or they led tours, they got just blasted. Their business went to zero. And so Rick could have laid all his employees off. He didn't. He kept his staff on. 
And uh, he, in an interview recently, he was asked about that decision. And this is what he said. He said, our mission is to inspire Americans to venture beyond Orlando. We owe it to our mission to still be around after this is done. He means after the pandemic is done. So America can be less fearful and open to the world with a mindset of building bridges instead of building walls. And I love that sentence about a mindset of building bridges instead of building walls, because that sure is what we need right now in our world, isn't it? So let me stop for one second and I'm gonna reshare so that we can watch this uh, video couple clips from Rick and they are really good. So just sit back and enjoy this. I just wanted to mention he was on last uh, Sunday's uh, CBS show and they did, it wasn't very long, but it was a brief, the whole show was about travel and they interviewed him and he was really good. And he ba basically mentioned that same thing. Oh, thank you for sharing that. Do you think you could put that show and the name into the chat? Uh, I think it's CBS Sunday morning. CBS Sunday morning. Just put that in the chat, please, and we'll look for that. That that would be interesting to see that about travel and to see Rick okay. in context. I can do that. Also, um, I'll see if I can remember to send this to you in a class note at the end. He was on the Guy Raz's I Built This podcast, which is an NPR podcast, um, a little while back, and several of us have heard that. So that's, that's, that's very good also, just like the interview that he did with get set up a week or 10 days ago. So let me, let's, let's, without any further ado, watch a bit of Rick and uh, sit back and enjoy. Age of great castles, humbler groups in the door dome found refuge. Start again. Long before the age of great castles, humbler groups in the door dome found refuge in caves. La Roque St. Christophe, a series of river carved terraces has provided shelter to people here for 50,000 years. While the terraces were inhabited in prehistoric times, the exhibit you'll see today is medieval. The official recorded history goes back to 976 AD, when people settled here to steer clear of Viking raiders who'd routinely sail up the river. Back then in this part of Europe, the standard closing of a prayer wasn't amen, but and deliver us from the Norsemen, amen. A clever relay of river watchtowers kept an eye out for raiders. When they came, residents gathered up their kids, hauled up their animals, as you can imagine with the help of this big recreated winch, and pulled up the ladders. While there's absolutely nothing old here except for the carved out rock, it's easy to imagine the entire village, complete with butcher, baker, and even candlestick maker, in this family-friendly exhibit. From about 18,000 until 10,000 BC, long before Stonehenge and the pyramids, back when mammoths and saber-toothed cats still roamed the earth, prehistoric people painted deep inside caves in this part of Europe. These weren't just crude doodles, but huge and sophisticated projects, executed by artists and supported by an impressive culture, the Magdalenians. The region's limestone cliffs, honeycombed with painted caves, are unique on this planet. Tourists gather nearby at Lesco, home of the region's and the world's most famous cave paintings. These caves were discovered accidentally in 1940 by four kids and their dog. Over the next couple decades, about a million visitors climbed through the prehistoric wonderland, inadvertently tracking in fungus on their shoes and changing the humidity and the temperature with their breathing. In just 15 years, the precious art deteriorated more than in the 15,000 years before that. The caves were closed to the public. Visitors can now experience the wonder of Les Go by touring an adjacent replica. When their time comes, the visitors are called to meet their guide for a look at the precisely copied cave called Les Go II. Then we are in the Oxen Room, the most spectacular room of Les Go. It's a sacred place. We don't live in a church, they never lived in a caves. And it's a huge composition, it's a calculated composition because they have taken uh, advantage of the strip of rock to relate in a circle two groups of bulls facing each other. And in the center of this composition, they have united the three principal animals of Lascaux, horse, 
ox and deer. Is this a hunting scene? No, it's not a hunting uh, scene because on the walls, the hunter doesn't exist. They never tell the everyday life. The meaning is more complex. What is the biggest animal? Is this uh, bull. Is the largest painting in the cave art, 16 feet from the top of the horn to the tip of the tail. The guide explains that this 600 animal multi-cave composition was the work of a complex society, the Magdalenians. Their culture allowed for skilled artists to work over an extended period of time in this sacred place. They fix maybe on the walls a dream, a myth, a knowledge, and the image will be able to across generations. The image becomes the memory of the society. The art of fresco is supposed to be around 17,000 years old. But compared to the beginning of the humanity, which was born in Africa three million years ago, Lascaux, it was yesterday. They were like us. The region has many more examples of prehistoric cave painting, and the nearby National Museum of Prehistory provides an instructive background. This modern museum houses over 18,000 bones, stones, and fascinating little doodads, all uncovered locally. Artifacts are originals and show that while the Magdalenian people lived 15,000 years ago, they were far more advanced than your textbook cavemen. Skeletons were discovered draped in delicate jewelry. Stag teeth and tiny shells were, it seems, lovingly drilled to be strung into necklaces. These barbed spearheads and fish hooks would work well today. Finely carved spear throwers show impressive realism for something three times as old as the oldest pyramids. Imagine flickering flames from these oil lamps lighting those art-covered caverns. Today, as we ponder the prehistoric caves and the artifacts of the Magdalenian people here in the Dordogne, we can marvel at how much we actually have in common with these people and how sophisticated their culture was so long ago. The Latin Quarter is the core of the Left Bank, as the south side of the Seine River is known. This has long been the city's university district. In fact, the University of Paris, a leading university in medieval Europe, was founded here in the 13th century. Back then, the vernacular languages, like French and German, were crude, good enough to handle your basic needs. But for higher learning, academics, like this guy, spoke and corresponded in Latin. Until the 1800s, from Sicily to Sweden, Latin was the language of Europe's educated elite. And Parisians called this university district the Latin Quarter because that's the language they heard on the streets. Today, any remnant of that Latin is buried by a touristy tabouli of ethnic restaurants. Still, it remains a great place to get a feel for the tangled city before the narrow lanes were replaced by wide modern boulevards in the 19th century. The scholarly and artsy people of this quarter brewed up a new age, Paris's cafe scene. By the time of the revolution, the city's countless cafes were the haunt of politicians and philosophers who plotted a better future as they sipped their coffee. And the cafe society really took off in the early 1900s as the world's literary and artistic avant-garde converged on Paris. In now famous cafes along Boulevard Saint-Germain and Boulevard Saint-Michel, free thinkers like Hemingway, Lenin, and Jean-Paul Sartre enjoyed the creative freedom these hangouts engendered. With its cafe and university scene, Paris had long been a launch pad for bold new ideas. In the 18th century, groundbreaking political and social thinking by French philosophers like Voltaire and Rousseau ushered in the Age of Enlightenment. Later, this enlightenment provided the French Revolution with a philosophical basis, and it gave the American Constitution many of its basic principles. Paris honors its intellectual and cultural heroes with tombs and memorials in its neoclassical pantheon. It looks like an ancient temple, but it's only about 250 years old, from the time of the Enlightenment. During the Enlightenment and the Age of Revolution which followed, everything was subjected to what was called the test of reason. If it wasn't logical, it was tossed out. Nothing was sacred. 
the very notion of royalty was challenged, and churches were turned into temples of reason. Even the use of city land for cemeteries, as you learn at the catacombs of Paris, was rejected. The sign reads, halt. This is the empire of death. It kicks off a one-mile hike you won't soon forget. The anonymous bones of six million permanent Parisians line former limestone quarries deep under the streets. In 1785, Paris decided to make its congested city more spacious and sanitary by emptying the cemeteries, which traditionally surrounded churches, into this labyrinthine ossuary. For decades, priests led ceremonial processions of black-veiled, bone-laden carts into the quarries, where the bones were carefully and artistically stacked as much as 80 feet deep. Each transfer was finished with a plaque identifying from which church the bones came and the date they arrived. While there is history in Dem Bones, the Carnivalet Museum, filling a lavish old aristocratic mansion, is the best place to sort through the story of Paris. Pre-revolutionary France had a government by, for, and of the wealthy. And as the rich got richer and richer, people who lived in fabulous mansions like this became blind to the growing gap between the haves and have-nots in their country. Louis XIV, a.k.a. the Sun King, was the ultimate king back when people accepted the notion that a few were born to rule and be rich, while most were born to be ruled and taken advantage of. Room after room shows the opulence of the upper classes in the age leading up to the revolution. Louis XIV, who enjoyed the luxury but anticipated trouble, said, Après moi, le déluge. After me, the flood. The heart of the museum features that deluge, which hit when this man, Louis XVI, was king. The French Revolution was kicked off with the storming of the Bastille prison. Supporting the angry masses, the liberal wing of the government took matters into its own hands, declaring it wouldn't quit until the people had a constitution. It was vive la nation, liberté, égalité, and fraternité, until the people literally beheaded the king and queen. the Place de la Révolution, or Revolution Square. It was here that the newfangled guillotine, considered a humane form of execution in its day, was set up. And it was here that Marie Antoinette, Louis XVI, and over 2,000 others were made a foot shorter at the top. According to this painting, it took three to run the guillotine, one to manage the blade, one to catch the blood, and one to hold the head, in this case of Marie Antoinette, up to the crowd. Today, Paris's vast Revolution Square is called Place de la Concorde, Place of Harmony. The guillotine is long gone, and its centerpiece is an Egyptian obelisk. The king and queen were beheaded by a stark and egalitarian government, but the French love of fine living couldn't be kept down. The 19th century was a boom time for Paris. The entire city was beautified with grand new boulevards and fancy architecture. It was an exuberant age of money. If you had it, you flaunted it. From the Place de la Concorde, the Champs-Élysées, once a royal carriageway, now Europe's grandest boulevard, leads to the Arc de Triomphe. The arch was dedicated to the victory of the people and their republic, the triumph of French nationalism. Bayou with a pleasant town center and only six miles from the D-Day beaches, makes a great home base for visiting the area's sites. Along the 75 miles of Atlantic coast nearby, you'll find countless memories of the largest military operation in history. It was on these beautiful beaches at the crack of dawn, June 6, 1944, that the Allies finally gained a foothold in France and Nazi Europe began to crumble. During the D-Day invasion, American troops and their allied partners courageously assaulted the German-occupied cliffs using grappling hooks and ladders. While ultimately victorious, they suffered horrendous losses. Smashed German bunkers and bomb craters remain, only hinting at the unimaginable carnage and chaos of that momentous day. 
the small town of Aromanche was ground zero for the D-Day invasion. Almost overnight, the Allies erected an immense prefab port, enabling them to begin their victorious push to Berlin. Imagine the building of this incredible harbor. Seventeen old ships steamed across the English Channel and were sunk, bow to stern, creating a four-mile-long protective breakwater. Then, with massive concrete platforms and roads floating on pontoons nearly a mile long, the harbor was completed. Within six days, 300,000 Allied troops and all their equipment had established a beachhead here in France. And less than a year later, the war was over. Today, 60 years later, the town, with its beachcombers, holiday trinkets, and families at play, still seems to celebrate that Allied victory. Peace came at a huge price. The invasion cost over 4,000 Allied lives. The American cemetery at Saint Laurent crowns a bluff just above Omaha Beach in the eye of the D-Day storm. Thousands of tombstones glow in memory of Americans who gave their lives here to help free Europe. The bluff overlooks the stretch of Normandy Beach called the Portal of Freedom. While tranquil now, for those of us who weren't there, the horror of that day is impossible to imagine. From the memorial, with a bronze statue symbolizing the spirit of America's youth, a peaceful sea of crosses invites those visiting to wander and ponder the sacrifice so many brave men made in the cause of freedom. Immediately after the war, all the bodies were buried in temporary graves. In the 1950s, when this cemetery was established, the families decided if the bodies should remain with their comrades or be brought home. Officers are disproportionately represented. Their families figured they'd prefer to be buried with the men they commanded and with whom they fought and died. Nearby, another military cemetery is the resting place of 21,000 German soldiers. The centerpiece symbolizes German mothers and fathers who lost their children. The site, glum, with two graves per simple marker and dark crosses that huddle together in groups of five, is a somber reminder that many young Germans were victims of Hitler as well. The best World War II museum in France is in Caen, the first big city freed by the Allies. Officially named the Memorial for Peace, it puts the Battle of Normandy in a broader context. You start with a downward spiral stroll, tracing, almost psychoanalyzing the path Europe followed from the end of World War I to the rise of fascism and into World War II. You'll get a thorough look at how World War II was fought, from individual weapons to floating airports to the two-ton V-1, the unmanned predecessor of today's smart bombs, to the D-Day landings. The Cold War wing gives an overview of the bipolar world that followed World War II. It gives insights into the battle waged by the USSR and the USA for the hearts and minds of their people until the collapse of communism in 1989. The memorial then takes you beyond war. The Gallery of Nobel Peace Prizes celebrates the irrepressible human spirit. It honors the courageous and too often inconspicuous work of people like Albert Schweitzer, Mother Teresa, Martin Luther King, and many lesser-known champions of justice who understand that true peace is more than just an absence of war. The contemplative finale is a walk through the U.S. Armed Forces Memorial Garden. Plaques honor the sacrifice young American soldiers made for Europe. of children enjoying this memorial as a playground captures the spirit of the quote etched in the pavement. From the heart of our land flows the blood of our youth, given to you in the name of freedom.
Well, that was quite a swing through history in France from uh, 10 to 50,000 years ago to the French Revolution to D-Day. Who, uh, I'm gonna check the chat here, see if there's any comments or questions. Um, but if anybody has uh, any comments or questions about what we watched today, three very different periods of history. So uh, those of you that have been, have been in France may have seen some of those, maybe some have seen all of them. Uh, go ahead and raise your hand or uh, you can put a virtual hand up. That's probably the best way to hit the reaction button and put up a virtual hand Then I can call you call on you in order in case I because I can't quite see everybody in one screen but uh, we'd we'll love to hear some reactions uh, from people that have visited any of these places or spent time there yes Susan I was going to say that every time um, Every time I uh, try to tell anybody about my visit to the American Cemetery at Normandy, I, I, I can't, I always cry. Mm -hmm. Anybody else been there? Yeah. This is Karen. Yes, Karen. Um, and I understand what she just said about how emotional it is. And when we were there, and that gets back to the beauty of travel, you never know what's gonna happen when you're traveling out of your you know, comfort zone. The day we were there, we noticed there was a lot of activity and people were bustling around and there was music and there were flags. And we ended up meeting, I ended up meeting in the ladies room. It was the family of the, um, I forget their last name, but the movie was Saving Private Ryan. And it was the family that lost all the, the sons. Is that, so that right? That family was there that day. It was a, a special um, anniversary day. And they were all there honoring um, the sons at their grave. So the tour guide, you know, included us and took us there. And it was unbelievably emotional. Wow. I, I can believe it. Hmm. And Normandy sure has a lot of history besides that, too. I'd like to make one more comment about Normandy. Um, we, my husband and I have been fortunate to travel a lot and that is one place, it's the most American place we've ever been outside of America. The, the feeling of the, the love for Americans and the one, wanting to talk about America and talk about American history and World War II. We've never been to a place that was, um, we like to say that um, pro-American outside of America. Uh huh. Very good. Actually, America. Looking back to the first segment, is there anybody here who's been to the caves in Lascaux? John and Nancy. Yeah, it, it was a really, it was a wonderful experience. Um, one of the things that struck me, and I don't know if you said this because I was called away beginning um they were discovered by i think four boys who were chasing their dog who was chasing a ball that went down the hole except that there was a fifth boy but he was jewish so they couldn't they couldn't publicize that um at the mm. time until after you know much time had passed and and it was in the 40s that it was in the 40s they they just it was too tense to expose him to that. So they kept that quiet, which I found really interesting. That is interesting. I find the art in those caves, I haven't seen them, but I've read about them because my mother-in-law has been there several times and she is an artist and she does, she's copied that. Um, I find the idea that they were painted tens of thousands of years ago in such a beautiful and sophisticated way in a cave where they would have been using not electric flashlights like our guide was using, but oil lamps or torches or something. We don't know exactly. Uh, I find that mind boggling. That is just uh, the sophistication with which they painted and the fact, and the fact that they did it in there uh, is just amazing to me. Just amazing. John. Uh, basically, I wanted to share as well. Uh, my son-in-law's dad lives in the, in uh, 
the Dordogne region, and we've been over there a couple times to visit. And one of the fascinating things is when we went to the market, which was once a week, there was more English spoken than French. And I said to I said to my let's see my my daughter's father-in-law. I I said to David. I said David. I said, I feel like I'm in England. He said, there's the largest population of English in the world outside of the UK here in the Dordogne. He said, this is where we retire and get away from the weather. He said, the only reason we come here is because of the weather and the food. Yeah, two great reasons. <laughs> he used to be Aquitaine and he said, it used to be English and we're reclaiming it one family at a time. Uh, I have read about that huge English expat community in the Dordogne. Yes, I have. That's quite interesting. Anyone else been to the caves or that region that want to talk about? It, it is beautiful. If not, what about the left bank? When I visited Paris in 2013, uh, my wife and daughter and I intentionally wanted to stay in the on the left bank near the university. We we stayed maybe th three or four American blocks from uh, the Seine and very near Notre Dame. Uh, very um, touristy, but also fascinating area. Uh, and he mentioned going up. Rue Saint-Germain, and I knew exactly what it was talking about, because if you're right around the center of uh, the left bank, um, it is very touristy, but all you got to do is get a little bit away on Saint-Germain, and suddenly you are where the Parisians go, and it's a whole different city, and we really enjoyed that. I noted um, that he showed the Pantheon, and we went in the Pantheon, um, uh, my name, I'm drawing a blank, the name of the famous French philosopher who's buried there, but it is sort of a secular temple um, and an amazing place to go into itself. Near there is where the, there the steps are featured for Midnight in Paris. We did discuss Midnight in Paris in yesterday's class. If anybody hasn't seen that, yeah. uh, just a feel good movie, uh, just a lot of fun. And if you need to laugh, uh, watch Midnight in Paris. But there's a lot to see there in the wet left bank, the the, the uh, old university quarter, and we we loved it there. And uh, Paris is an extremely walkable city, and beautiful. Um, you don't have the high rises like you do in other major cities in the center. It's uh, they've allowed the vistas and the views to still be seen, and it's definitely a city to see on foot. So we we loved it. Anybody else been to that part of Paris? Want to say anything about what you experienced there? Verna, oh, I mean, oh Verna, you, you're talking about something else. Okay, very good. The other thing he mentioned was that when he was at the D-Day beaches, he went to Bayeux, uh, which um, is also very famous for something he didn't mention. And I believe there is a Rick Steves video you can see about this, but there's something that's known as the Bayeux Tapestry. And it was commissioned by, I'm now forgetting which English king, um, I, it, I'm not sure if it was uh, William the Conqueror or one of his sons, but this tapestry is very long. Uh, maybe one of you can tell me how long it is. I want to say it's over 100 feet long, and it depicts the whole story of the uh, victory of William the Conqueror over Harold, the English king, in uh well, they call it the Battle of Hastings. It actually didn't take place in Hastings. It took place on a field and the town is now called battle <laughs> because that's where the battle took place and it's on a hillside if you're british you call it battle not rather than battle it is a, a very interesting place to visit but the tapestry tells that whole story and um 
there are fascinating scenes on that tapestry uh, of places in medieval England. And I've been to some of the places that are featured on the tapestry. I haven't seen the tapestry yet. Normandy is still a place I want to get to. Joanne. 230 feet long. Thanks, Joanne. <laughs> you, you gave it there. It was even more than 100 feet long. I knew it was really long. I've it's seen uh, the tapestry twice. The first time in 2007. And there's a cathedral close to it. And both times I was there, they were having a medieval festival. It was really fun. I've, I've seen it also. And it's, it's displayed in, a, um, you walk through a very dark, dark room and the, and the, the, the it's, it's actually not a tapestry, it's an embroidery. And it's displayed, they have the whole thing unrolled in a, in a lighted case. And you can see the detail of the, of the work. It's, it's very beautiful. It is. Can either of you date it for me? I'm, I'm, I couldn't remember which English king it was made for. Um, don't know for sure. I'd have to look it up. But I, I I'm, I'm pretty sure it was close to the time of, of when, uh, you know, right after the, um, the uh, Normans um, conquered the uh, um, that part of Britain. 1066, but, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yes, Carolyn. In Paris, yeah, I was alone most of the time. It's been quite a few years, but I remember finding a very small museum and sitting in not in real darkness, but, you know, and music playing, and it was the four unicorn tapestries. Has anyone seen them? Four unicorn tapestries. I can hear. That's in Paris. That's what she was saying, uh -huh, in Paris. You've oh, seen yeah. it, Joanne? Mm -hmm. Yes. I'm trying to remember the name of the museum. It's a... Um, yeah. There's so many museums in Paris. They have... The, the French have a museum for everything. They would be, and it would be worth some yeah, time going cool. to Paris off-season, like February, early March, and just going through museums. Because if you're going to be indoors all day, you might as well go in the off season when uh, it, the, everything's cheaper. Anybody else want to talk about uh, Paris or the La caves of Lascaux or Normandy that perhaps you visited there? I've been to Normandy, the beach. The first time I was there was 2007, and it is very sad. It's very, mm -hmm. very sad. Mm -hmm. That's what I remember the most. <laughs> Any more comments about France history? I'll I'm going to share with you something else here about some upcoming classes, but I don't want to preempt anyone who'd like to tell it. Yeah, uh, John, I'm uh, not sorry, John, yes. Yeah, just a quick comment. If you're going to go to Normandy, be sure to go to Brittany. I think the Brittany is not as publicly acknowledged, but it's a wonderful, wonderful experience. Get a car and just drive around. Yes, I have also, that's another place I want to go. I've heard that Brittany is beautiful. There's lots, it also is Celtic culture. And there are some amazing standing stones in Brittany. Mont Saint Michel is close by, close to Normandy. It's, it's worth seeing. Yes. Though, probably a good place to go in the off season. <laughs> and I may be the only person in the group, but Rich Steves is not my favorite travel show. And one thing is, after you've seen more in depth and been there, for instance, uh, yeah, Revolution, there were only 15 people 
in the prison. That's not the big story, you know. Just so many things. I think he's here. Thanks, Carolyn. We seem to have had a bad audio connection there. Um, oh, this is Karen. Uh, sure, Karen. Then I'll succeed Fred after you. Go ahead. Um, I'm going to go ahead and piggyback on what I think it was John just said. Um, my best friend married a Frenchman, and I'm very fortunate because she has lived in France for 40 years. So we have access to different accommodations, and she lives in Brittany. And um, when we go to see her, she always suggests we come in September. She says that's the best month for weather, no tourist. And she took us to these unbelievable museums, cathedrals, and uh, the most tremendous um, change of tide. It's equal to the Bay of Fundy there. So your tidal changes, you'll be, standing, you'll be watching the water rush out in a little cove and you'll be seeing the boats actually falling over as you're there. Uh, but what I wanted to mention is every place she takes us, we're usually the only tourist there. It's very, very unoccupied during September. And it is spectacular. There's museums, there's churches, there's bed and breakfast. Uh, you don't have to make a reservation anywhere. And it is absolutely spectacular. Wow, that's good news. Okay, so now I've got it written down. Visit Brittany in September. The weather's great and the tourists are not. So that's really good to hear. Thank you, Karen. You've given us a great tip. Fred. Uh, yeah, I'm an old sailor and on my bucket list is the, it's called the Canal du Midi. And this canal runs from the Mediterranean near the French uh, Spanish border all the way ac across the, uh, to the Bay of Biscay via, <coughs> winds up in Bordeaux. So if you're interested in boats and wine uh, and all along the way is Carcassonne, which is a famous medieval walled city also. So that's kind of that route sort of on my bucket list. So Fred, I've got a movie for you and maybe next week in one of our classes, I'll show the, uh, a clip from it, the, uh, the, the um, trailer called Camino Voyage about a group of Irishmen who paddle from Ireland all the way to Santiago de Compostela and they use part of that canal that you're speaking of uh, for their route. So I'll, I'll, I'll make sure next week in one of our evening or afternoon sessions that we, I show you the trailer of uh, the Camino Voyage because uh, it's on Amazon Prime. You can see it for free and it's really inspiring. And by the way, I think all of the men that, I, that row this are at least over 50 and quite a few of them are over 65. So if you think that he's too old to do something, think again. Could you put that in the chat, the name of that movie? I'll put that in the chat and then I'll, I'll also make a note that next week I should show you the, the trailer for it because it's very inspiring and I, I loved watching it. Lil. I just noticed I heard someone say they missed Rick Steves, the replay of his live event is tonight at six o'clock. And thank you. Thank you for telling me. Yes, I, sh I would have come to that announcement tonight at six o'clock Eastern Daylight Time. So yeah, I bet you can't get in the class. You want to bet? I want to try bet? to see if you can get in, but is it will also be replayed several times more. So if you look at it, you can, um, uh, if you look it up on the website, you should be able to register for one of the classes, and it's really good. Yeah, I'll make sure I put I the. Uh, tried twice. <laughs> okay. I'll make sure I, I get the register the uh, the note of that film, the Camino Voyage, in the notes at the end. And um, let me also just do a quick screen share with you about some upcoming classes next week that I'm doing on travel. We got a whole new series coming up in May, but we've got more starting up next week, and I've got some of them listed here. Uh, by the way. We didn't get this far. This was the map of France where we were today. There's Paris 
and this is Normandy, and then uh, Lasco is somewhere down here. Some uh, Monday at uh, these are all Eastern Standard Eastern Daylight Times. We'll uh, we'll do my slope travel class again at three thirty. Uh, we have a great class coming up on Wednesday, the 28th, 2.30 Eastern Daylight Time about solo travel. I got a panel of learners who are all expert solo travelers. And if any of you are solo travelers, please come and join us and give your uh, best solo travel tips. Also on the 26th, that's Monday, I will be doing uh, another one of my travel sessions about a pilgrimage to Ione and Lindisfarne, the two holy isles of Great Britain. Next Friday, I'll be doing a city tour of Munich and York. That's Friday at 11 a.m. And uh, on Wednesday, uh, April 28th, 11 a.m., I'll be doing a class on how to use Google Slides to create a slideshow for travel pics. So I know some people have asked me how I do the kind of slideshows I have. And it's a great thing to do if you want to make a slideshow of travel pics and you can share them on Zoom with other people. We're out of time now, and I really appreciate everyone that's been here I today. I get in there, Ross. I just tried. Okay. I'll, 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 I'll make sure you, you, you contact help at getsetup.io, and they will take care of your problem for you, Nancy. I'm sure they can help you out. I want to thank all of you for being here today. You were a great group. I thank all of you that have been with us for the last couple of weeks. We've got one more week of Rick Steves. Next week, 7.30 Monday, we'll be doing the next session on island hopping again. I appreciate all of you that came, and I look forward to seeing you next week. Have a great weekend, everybody. Thanks so much. Thanks, everybody, for all the info. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.